Hi everyone, I'm Rosemarie Miller here with Emma Whitford, an education reporter here at Forbes, here to tell us about determining the actual cost of college. Thank you so much for joining me today, Emma. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So Emma, how do you see the role of financial aid in making college education accessible, especially those from underrepresented backgrounds? I think for most families, Going to college these days is not really possible without financial aid. I mean, you see so many media reports of the rising cost of college, of rising sticker prices, climbing into the 70, 80, 90K range. And for most people, they cannot afford an investment like that without some kind of financial aid. So it's definitely a huge part of the college application process for almost every student these days. So can you explain some of the challenges students and families face in trying to understand the true cost of college? Yeah, it's actually really hard to figure out exactly what you might pay to go to college. We can look up tuition prices at a given institution and what you'll find typically is just the sticker price, mm -hmm. which is how much they're charging for tuition that year but almost no students actually pay that price at most private institutions and a lot of public institutions as well. They will pay what's called the net price, which is the out-of-pocket price that comes after financial aid and loans are taken into account typically. So it's really hard to determine without going through the financial aid process what that cost actually will be. Yes. Wow, that's interesting. You never really know how much you're paying to go to college. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's very frustrating. So how do private colleges utilize tuition discounting as a strategy, and what impact does it have on the perceived cost of education? Yeah, a lot of private colleges practice tuition discounting, which is setting a high net price and then in turn dealing out these really significant financial aid packages for students. So the actual cost that you would pay to attend is more like 50, 40, 30% of what the listed price is. Mm. And for many colleges, it's a marketing strategy. They want to signal that they're a great institution that offers an amazing education and that's why it's really expensive. And at the same time, they really want these students to come, so they'll entice them with these really hefty financial aid packages. And that's a really common practice for almost all private colleges in the U.S. So what determines the pricing strategies of the highly selective and well-endowed private colleges versus those that don't have billion-dollar endowments? Yeah, it's a little bit different. So there is a class of colleges at the top, think the Ivy League, some smaller, well-recognized colleges like Amherst, Stanford, MIT. Those colleges have a lot of money that they can put towards financial aid. So if you're making, I think at Harvard, it's 85000 or less a year, you're going to pay nothing to attend. Um, it's still a really small amount if your family's making even six figures to attend. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can do that because there are still a lot of students that want to go to that school that will pay full price and that they can support their financial aid budgets with those large endowments. But there's obviously a lot of private colleges in the U.S. that don't have that name recognition and don't have those endowments. And those are the ones that implement that tuition discounting strategy like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So they're shooting for maybe 30 to 40 K per student, but they're going to set their price closer to 60 or 70 so that they can offer that financial aid and sort of woo the student to enroll. Wouldn't that kind of repel students from applying, then, then bring more students? It does. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it does. If you don't understand that you're likely going to be offered a significant financial aid package, you're probably not going to apply at all if you're mm -hmm. thinking, okay, well, I'm going to have to pay sixty or $70,000 a year to go here. Right. So how do high school students, particularly those surveyed by Niche and Art and Science Group, um, perceive and react to the college sticker prices? Yeah, those surveys were really interesting because it showed that around half of the students surveyed aren't even going to consider a college that has a sticker price of over $40,000. 
which is a little shocking because we found in the latest college trends and pricing report that the College Board puts out every year that the average sticker price at a four-year private college is $41,000. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of students that are not even going to look at your website, they're not going to put in an application, they're not going to look at financial aid because they've already decided they don't think that they can afford to go there. They're not even willing to take out loans. It's a lot of loans to take out. <laughs> But isn't isn't part of the reason you ch you choose certain schools because you think, okay, maybe one day I'll be able to pay this back? That's definitely true, but it's not true for every graduate. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're going to get that return on investment that you want for going to college, you have to graduate, first of all. Um, you also have to be going into a field where you have high earning potential, and for a lot of students, they aren't going to have the earning potential to make an investment that's that significant worth it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's primarily an issue of just advertising because even though the return on investment might be great at some of these schools because the student will only end up paying say 15 to 20k a year to go there, they just don't even know that because mm -hmm. they haven't looked past the sticker price that's advertised on Google or, or the website. So how effective do you find the net price calculators uh, in helping students estimate their out-of-pocket expenses? They're really useful. Um, they can get you really close to knowing exactly what you're going to have to pay to attend a specific institution. It'll break down things like what merit aid you might receive, what need-based aid you might receive, um, federal grants like a Pell Grant that you could earn and also if there are loans available what options you might have there. Mm -hmm. That said, they're very cumbersome and require inputting a lot of information that most 17, 18 year olds just don't know. Things mm -hmm. like your parents mortgage balance, their retirement account balance, uh, even their checking and savings accounts. So it's not something that they can typically do without their parents involved. And I think that makes it a bit of a hurdle for a lot of students that are early on in the college search process. So could you compare the price calculators like my intuition versus other calculators? Yeah, so every college is required by the Department of Education to have a net price calculator on its website and those are the really big <laughs> cumbersome calculators that account for every single type of student. They're really helpful if you can get all the way through them. Mm -hmm. And then there are calculators like My Intuition, which is designed to account for most students, but it's very pared down, it's a lot simpler. So a lot of colleges will offer you both. They'll say, why don't you start with My Intuition, see if you can get a good price on this. Um, if you can't get a perfect estimate, then go on to this larger, more cumbersome calculator, and that will definitely be able to give you an estimate. Mm -hmm. That said, my intuition still does ask for information like mortgage, 401k, checking and savings account balances, that you'll definitely want a parent with you if you're filling that out. Mm -hmm. So let's switch gears a little bit to FAFSA form. There have been some changes made recently to FAFSA. How, how will that affect students and families? Yeah, there will be changes this year. The FAFSA is expected to come out now on December 31st. Hopefully they will stick to that timeline. Um, and it's supposed to be simplified this year, so there will be a number of fields that you'll be able to skip. I think they said that some students will have to fill out only 18 fields and it'll take about 10 minutes, which is pretty great compared to how complicated the form used to be. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is to make it a lot simpler, to encourage more students to fill it out. Whether that works, we will see in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> so how can school counselors help students, regardless of income, compare FAFSA and consider the, uh, the broader financial aid process? I think having opportunities to help students and families walk through the FAFSA with a counselor can be really helpful. There was a counselor I spoke with at the Hmong College Prep Academy, which is a charter school in Minnesota, and they hold FAFSA nights 
where they bring in 10 to 15 college counselors and a bunch of students and parents and everyone sits around and fills out the FAFSA together mm -hmm. and they can obviously call on counselors you know right away to help walk them through it if they have any questions. Mm -hmm. I think that can be really really helpful working through this form which asks about a lot of things that especially if you're maybe the first kid in your family to go to college and it's the first time you and your parents are seeing these terms, it can be helpful to have someone right there with you. And, and in the article you recently published for Forbes, you talked about a CSS profile, a College Board CSS profile. What exactly is that and how, how can it be made more accessible to students? Yeah, the CSS profile is something that's required by a few hundred additional private colleges, so they'll ask for the FAFSA as well as the CSS. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially just a more detailed financial aid form. They're going to ask you for more information. They might have more questions on there that will relate to merit aid awards that you could receive. Um, it's not required by all colleges, so definitely most students won't need to fill it out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also a little bit different because it does have a fee associated with it. I believe it's $25 for the first submission and then 16 for every additional college that you want to send it to. So I think having waivers for that fee, which the College Board does for some students, and um, if colleges implement that as well, that helps make it a little bit more accessible. But it's definitely not a form that most students need to fill out unless they're applying to one of these specific schools. So speaking of merit aid, why are colleges kind of hesitant to promote it more widely? Yeah, a lot of colleges will advertise that, you know, 90 to 100 percent of their students receive some kind of aid, but I think there is still a sense around merit aid that it's something that the student wants to feel really good about having earned. So you're unlikely to see a school that's going to say, you know, 100 percent of our students receive 20 grand in merit aid because they want those scholarships to feel special and important and sort of encourage the student to enroll. Mm -hmm. uh, but at a lot of private co colleges, you do see them giving out merit aid to a lot of students as long as they meet a certain academic threshold. So how do students and families typically react when they discover the availability of merit aid scholarships? It's pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it makes the biggest difference for families that are maybe thinking, you know, private colleges are off the table because we can't afford fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. But then learning that merit aid scholarships are available and it's not just you know one to two thousand dollars. It can be up to twenty, twenty-five thousand, even more. Mm -hmm. And now they're looking at a sticker price of you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollars, it brings a lot more colleges uh, back into the pool of options for them. So finally, Emma, what advice would you give to students, families, educational institutions about navigating the financial aid process? I will sound like a broken record, but I definitely think it's important to reach out to financial aid officers, reach out to your high school counselors, ask as many questions as you need. This is complicated stuff. I know when I was applying to college, I was super overwhelmed by all of these forms. So talking to somebody that has done it before and, and knows what they're doing is really important. And then just remembering that the sticker price is likely not what you're going to pay. I think if everyone can keep that in mind going into the college search process, that will give them a lot more options while they're looking at schools. That is major. The sticker price is likely not what you're going to pay. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me today, Emma. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.